Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And today we're going to be taking a look back at the character interviews between Mankind and Jim Ross in 1997. I think this is probably the breakthrough moment for the Mankind character, not just for the audience, but with Vince McMahon as well. We're also going to go ahead and revisit the matches from King of the Ring 1997. You may recall 96 was supposed to be Triple H's year. It happens in 97 and mankind suffers a pretty brutal loss in the process, man. He was pulling out all the stops with China and, uh, it was quite the match hunter and mankind in 1997 before either guy had really tasted WWE championship gold. Well, I don't really count the intercontinental title. You know what I mean? We're also going to talk about the dude love pitch and how the WWF showed some death match footage which seems hard to believe that that happened in 1997. We'll talk about the King of the ring and what it meant once upon a time. Of course, we've got to talk about Madison square garden and believe it or not, we're even going to talk about that WAP. Yeah. The WAP. I'll let you guess what that stands for. Stay tuned boys and girls. We're going to have fun today on a very special edition of Foley is pod. Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod, and of course we couldn't do it without Mister In Your House, the hardcore legend himself, the Hall of Famer, Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? Uh, I'm doing great. I just came from Whataburger. I'm nourished, not just my body, but I'd say my soul as well. So, wow, Did big you see fan my of eyes light up when you told me last week that there was a Whataburger in town. I, I, I haven't seen you that excited in a while. <laughs> So what's your go-to order at Whataburger? <clears throat> you know what? This is, I think there's a lesson to be learned here, right? We can talk about other things as long as wrestling is our tether. Sure. Is that when I go a little too fancy, you know, if I go with the uh, sweet and spicy uh, barbecue burger, it's good, but it's got so many, there's so many geosimics involved mm-hmm. that you kind of lose. You take away. You take away a little bit. And so I remember, you know, maybe 2014, uh, when the Daniel Bryan craze was at its apex, um, it was clear the fans wanted to see Daniel in that main event. And I think I sent out a tweet that said, sometimes you just want that perfect steak. You don't need all the toppings on it. And it felt to me, and it's part of a necessity because Royal Rumble, end of January. Now we've got to go nine, 10 weeks or at least two months. Yeah. Uh, so instead of having the, your, your, your uh, main event set in stone and building towards that, which you can do with a four or five week build, now you've got to, you got to throw in some of the gimmicks and the toppings. And in some ways it takes away from what the fans want. Yeah. And uh, so I'm suggesting they just move the Royal Rumble to the end of February and wow. that you have no other pay-per-view in between that. And that it's like, boom, once you win that Royal Rumble, you're locked in for that main event. I mean, 2000, in 2000, I think it was, um, I'm not sure if it was 2000. It may have been 2000. Yeah, it may have been 2000. Um, the main event was set, but then Shawn Michaels super kicked uh, Benoit, I think, and then signed that. That was 04. 04, okay. Yeah. And then signed the contract, and I was like, man, I'm a stickler for details. I don't know if that's going to fly legally. Like, and Sean should have known <laughs> a three way main event. A three way main event. Crazy. You can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, the, so the Whataburger reminded me because uh, this wasn't the first time I, I was there last night as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that was when I had the sweet and spicy. Today, Today you I went just, traditional. I went traditional, and I just ordered the, and I did want bacon on it. I wanted the mustard, and then they said mustard comes with it. So I was wondering, when uh, what are they putting all the gimmicks? And they did. They came fully loaded. But but it was the things you expect on a burger, you know, a little bit of lettuce, tomatoes, they onions. They through yeah. the garden, and it was it was delicious, yeah. delicious, yeah. Uh, I'm not a Whataburger guy. Grillo, our cameraman, is a huge Whataburger guy. Well, what are you? What kind of guy are you, as Jerry I'm a Shake Lawler Shack said? Guy. <laughs> <You really? laughs> That's a cold dust line. I like that. Uh, I like Shake Shack. Shake well, that Shack's line was originally from. Uh, 
uh, Andy Kaufman. Oh, that's right. On the David Letterman that's show, right. saying, "I could have sued you, but I'm not that kind of guy." And then I Lawler remember. said, "What kind of guy are you?" And a hush came over the crowd. Were you watching that live? I was watching it live. It was the first episode of Letterman I ever saw. And I was visiting my brother, John, who was a freshman at Indiana University. And Indiana had been voted, Bloomington, Indiana, had one of the top 10 pizzas in the country as voted really? that year. Yeah, I think it was Mama Bear's Pizza. And it was late. So my brother ended up being down by the loading dock during the entirety of the Letterman show. Missed that whole thing. And oh, then wow. after that point, Letterman became a huge hit with me. Sure. And that Lawler, that was a, something we were talking about uh, last week where the Lawler stuff with uh, Andy Kaufman, I thought to myself and said to my friends, like, okay, I know the rest of that wrestling is what it, but that, brother, that's real. Well, it, it felt real. Um, as a fan at the time, were you quote unquote smartened up? <sighs> I was only smart in the sense that I watched a lot. I looked for loopholes. I, I guess I wasn't. I guess I was one of those fans who thought I knew the deal and then got the rude interrupt, rude awakening when I actually got into training and found. I was. I thought my the, my flair for the theatric was going to tie you know carry me over. At that point, you you could get in without being super athletic, right? Right. Like uh, the wrestling I grew up on was uh, mainly one sided squash matches, and you know it was a lot of uh, it was a lot of uh, grinding, pounding meat. I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, it was a lot of you know guy, heels come in, they got to establish themselves in the first five or six weeks so they could work with Bruno, and that was what I was used to. It's just a bunch of moves uh, to, and then you wanted to see and some crowd work. Yeah, and some crowd work, uh, and it was great. It's just a one-hour show. I thought it was great, um, but I would look at the loopholes, and I would. Say, but then you end up seeing loopholes that are not actually there. Where even when you see something, a blow that, you know, and make no mistake about it, guy, heels are on TV or baby faces, you lay that stuff in, right? Yeah. You lay it in. I mean, I found that out the hard way when I did my second match. And that was against, I went from having one match in front of a couple hundred people, the Clarksburg Armory uh, in West Virginia, against Kurt Kaufman to being in front of 17,000 at the Providence Civic Center. And when my mom saw me the next day in the parking lot, uh, in Hartford, she and my dad had gone to Providence and they just happened to see me. It wasn't like we arranged it via cell phone. And I was so clearly out of it, you know, because I, you know, I had a concussion. And my mom said, I, I thought it was fake. And I looked at her and said, Mom, nothing ever felt more real in my life. Yeah. So we, most people have no idea how hard guys are hitting, and no. women too, especially on television. Or the old WWF rings. That was like falling oh, on concrete. Oh, man, yeah. Like fans a lot of times just think, oh, that's uh, all. Yeah. <laughs> the Dick Ebersol ring. The rumor is, the story I heard is Dick Ebersol saw the ring moving, didn't want the ring on Saturday night's main event to move. So WWE had new rings built, but then they shipped them all around on the house shows. And that's why I think the work rate was not what it could have been and not what it uh, later would be. And why guys like Dynamite wound up getting yeah, yeah, really the worst right. wear later in yeah. life. Well, what we're talking about today is 25 years ago. There is more to the show than just Whataburger Talk uh, <laughs> or Booger Talk from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think I, I was thinking about that, wondering if we should have gone there. But I think what we gained was uh, letting uh, men and women out there know that we all do it. We all do it. We all do it. Yeah. It's just a matter. Are you then the type of guy who will seek out? Uh, you know, a place to wash the hands. Yeah. Well, you, you know, or do you just go there and and pass your boogers on to your fellow man? I hope they don't do that. I hope not either. Yeah. So I hope we're on track today. We're talking about 1997. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you had just beaten the, the young upstart Rocky Maivia. Who'd no. he ever beat? Uh, at Cold Day in Hell. And now we're going to talk about the build to King of the Ring 1997. Everything is about to change, though, because the day after Cold in Hell, what really winds up being the full pu the full push towards the, the Kane debut gets kicked into motion. You come out and introduce Uncle Paul, who's all wrapped up in bandages, his first appearance since the Undertaker fireball. And Paul tells Taker he's got one last chance before he reveals the shocking secret of Taker's past. 
from a creative standpoint, Bruce thinks this is one of the best stories the company ever told. Yeah. What do you think of the Kane backstory? I mean, we learned the backstory as we went. Yes. We've all conveniently uh, exercised Katie Vick. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, just wrote that one off as a huge mistake. Yeah, man, Kane, the, what he got in terms of longevity out of what seemed to be a throwaway character, throwaway character a one-dimensional character that could have had a great six to eight month, one year run and sure. turned that into a Hall of Fame career is a great credit to, to Glenn. Yes. And the subtleties he brought with it. So I, I thought that, but it was cool. It was really, and it was played so well to the point where when uh, Paul Bearer and, and Jerry Lawler have the backstage conversation that the camera just happens to capture. Yes. I mean, it just seems legit. I think that's one of those things. Now, this isn't a big move or a fierce feud yet, but it's one of those things that would send people to school going, that's his dad. You know, yeah. like, I know the rest of the summer that rest, but that's his dad. It was played so well, and it gave me that opportunity, as we spoke two weeks ago, to single-handedly grab Kane and console him, and with the strength of my upper body, just prevent him from doing any further damage <laughs> to himself or others. I have that type of tendon strength. Oh, I, we have no doubt. <laughs> uh, talk to me a little bit about Paul Bear. We don't talk about him enough as a wrestling community, and man, how much fun would he have with the medium we're doing right now, podcasting? He would have been yeah. phenomenal with oh, this. Oh, man. Gone way too soon. Really a sweetheart of a guy. I never met him, but that's what I hear from everyone. But this storyline, the reveal of, of Kane and the backstory, this is probably maybe the pinnacle of his career, right? Yeah, other than turning on Undertaker with oh, of course, okay, okay. of course, so, of course. So you can, it's possible to have two pinnacles in your career. I've seen it done. Yeah, uh, look, I knew Paul from way back in world class, right? in world class in '88 when he was Percival Pringle the third. As a matter of fact, there's not much visual evidence of Percy being in my scaffold match with Eric Embry, but we turned it into a tag team. It was me and Akbar against uh, Eric Embry and, and Percy. And the reason there's not much visual evidence is because Ak and Percy pretty much got down on their bellies on that ramp and stayed there for the duration. Uh, not too much in the way of action. Yeah. And I was the guy who took the bump, broke my right wrist, wow. ended up being the only guy in wrestling history to give a two-month notice because my broken wrist wouldn't heal correctly. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I loved it there, and uh, Paul Bear, P Percy was a baby face at the time. Um, I babysat for his two children on a few occasions, took them to the movies. So I already had some history, and then when I heard that he went to WWF, with this character, it just made perfect sense because Paul had been a real life uh, mortician. mortician. Yeah. So it was one of those things that fit like a glove. And The Undertaker, uh, the debut of The Undertaker was so incredible. And Bruce, you know, was obviously. Right there. And that was Kane The Undertaker it when was. he first debuted. How long did they keep the Kane name? Maybe not very long. Not very long, right? Yeah. I just really think they realized The Undertaker, the most successful of the profession characters, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I don't even think, like we said last time, I don't think most of us even thought of him as a profession, but. What's his name? The Undertaker, yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Um, so if somebody came in as the craftsman, yeah, he would be a great crafter, right? Uh, I'm going to put you in my scrapbook, brother. <laughs> With a fancy jagged trim. <laughs> um, it was so it was so fantastic. And the lead up to um, The Undertaker's debut is rumored that he was going to be the guy coming out of the egg. Which is just the egg crazy. Man, which sounds about. you know, and then they ended up having one of the all time stinkers in the gobbledy gooker come out and then one of the all time great reveals. The Undertaker, I was at a friend's a friend of a friend's uh, watching the uh, the show and it was I'll never forget it because on one and like on one level I understand this is the same guy I used to travel with, a good friend of mine, the other another level he was a different guy yeah he was a different guy so i think maybe a year after that fact uh after the debut 
um, I'm driving so, somewhere in the middle of nowhere and I see the hearse he used to drive. Him and Paul would be driven by a guy who had a, a real life hearse. And it's got the Undertaker, you know, it's clearly the Undertaker's vehicle. And I hopped out of my car, pursued their hearse through the drive through I think at McDonald's, and sounded very much like a 14-year-old girl going, it's me, <laughs> Mark, it's me, Cactus Jack, uh, you know. And it just, it didn't feel like the guy that I travel with. It felt like a different human being. So, Paul, that was a... a he was keeping the character in public. Keeping the character in public, as he did for most of his career. I can only imagine being a fan in that parking lot. Like, is that Cactus Jack <laughs> talking to the Undertaker? By the way, I got a good recognition at Whataburger. Oh, really? Yeah, a young lady said, excuse me, has anyone ever told you you look like that wrestler Mick Flurry? <laughs> McFlurry? That's across so, the street of McDonald's. It's Ireland. not McFlurry, Mick Foley, but uh, she goes, yeah, did anyone ever tell you? And I didn't have the teeth in, so I gave her the, this look, him. The, and she goes, are you him? And so, yeah. That's so, twice in Huntsville you've been writing that. I now. was thinking what we need to do at Christmas time, uh, Grillo, fire up the camera, and we'll do the Santa Claus drive through Oh, yeah. Where yes. Santa goes through and he gives out like the biggest tip they've ever received. I'm so, for it. Yeah, that's that's pretty pretty sweet, right? Yeah. You know what? What we should do is we should figure out what episode number we're on at the time. <laughs> okay. And then we'll just go to a bunch of places and tip people that amount of money. So if we're episode 101 or whatever it is, there you go. Ah, oh, I love it. Yeah, I love it. We went through. I wanted my kids to see what I did in the red suit, you know. So I took my four kids and I go, right, Dad, we're going to do the drive through. Yes, we are. And we go through the Dunkin' Donuts drive through. And they don't know, minimum $50, yeah. a $50 to $100 tip. And the woman wouldn't sell it at all. No smile, no acknowledgement that it was Santa at her drive through. So I didn't give her the tip. And we drove through, we proceed through, and. Um, my daughter says, Dad, do you think she has any idea how much money she just lost? Says, Probably not. But yeah, we will do the Santa Claus drive through Yeah. That and then like I can deduct that $100 bill on my taxes. Why not? Yes. Why not? Yes. I mean, it's Santa. So you're in the middle of contract negotiations in this era as we're getting you know, started talking about the summer of 97. Um, you mentioned before that you were meeting with Vince mm -hmm. and that you knew... Uh, that you had conveyed, hey, I want to be in that $400,000 range. He wanted to sort of put pen to paper. But you don't actually ink that new deal until after you do the sit-down interview, right. right? Okay. I believe it's the day after. I can't remember if I inked it or if he gave me the contract that I would later put the ink on. Um, but I was dealing from a position of strength because of the interviews that had just taken place the day before. It was one interview cut up into, uh, edited into several weeks worth of material, but I knew he liked it. And I didn't know to the, what extent, but uh, man, that was, it was, it was a really organic grassroots movement uh, that was, you know, fertilized by these promos I did with JR. We're going to put those in the link for our description below too. So be sure to check those out. If you haven't seen them in a long time, it's worth a look. Uh, in this era, though, you shoot a segment with Sonny for Shotgun Saturday Night, <laughs> where she asks you what the secret is. Uh, of course, we're talking about Paul Bear's secret. And you start by responding and yelling, how bad do you want to know? Uh, Tammy Sitch, pretty polarizing figure in professional <laughs> wrestling. But at this time, boy, she's at the, oh, she was, the yeah. height of her sure. run. Uh, one of the most downloaded celebrities in AOL. Well, Sid still hasn't returned, uh, and you're going to wind up doing a few main events with Taker instead of these tag matches with Sid. In fact, you headline against Taker at the Pepsi Arena in Albany. You've got 4,792 fans there. The next day, you're at MSG, and once again, you're wrestling The Undertaker. Uh, first, though, you cut a promo about how it's the anniversary of Bruno San Martino beating Buddy Rogers for the WWF World title. And the history is going to repeat itself tonight. And then you insult New York before having the bell rang ten times for the injured Paul Bear. <laughs> it's super fun. Normally reserved for someone who's fallen. No, he's just hurt, but let's ring the bell either way. Uh, this is the spiritual home, if you will, of Vince McMahon's WWF. His dad ran there. and uh, Sorry, that's pretty good stuff, though. It's great stuff. Great stuff. But the, the, we've always heard fans or, or, or the guys say that 
Vince holds the, the, the garden in such high regard. Like, if it gets over there, yeah. it'll get over. Almost like it's the barometer. Was that your experience with Vince, that he held it in that high regard? I remember quoting Vince to Vince uh, when, when Vince's uh, dad passed away. Or when, or when he was inducted into the Madison Square Garden Hall of Fame. I can't remember which event. He said uh, his dad told him, Vinny, the garden will always be the garden. Yes. And if you know, you know. If you have to try to explain that, even though I guess we're going to try to explain, <laughs> explain it now. It's just a really special place. Uh, I would say before pay-per-views, ma- the monthly Madison Square Garden show was the show that everyone wanted to be on. At that time, WWF uh, was running probably three shows a night. A town, B town, C town. C towns would be the high. They ran high school gyms back in the day. Yeah. And uh, everyone wanted to be on that garden show because it was the showcase. It was the best payoff, and it's always re- re- you know retained that special place in uh, in people's hearts, including Vince's. And that was true for a lot of territories. You know, in, in Georgia, for Georgia Championship Wrestling, it was the Omni. For Mid-Atlantic, it was Greensboro. Yeah. For the West Coast, it was the Cow Palace. Mm-hmm. But there's always been something special about New York, not just in wrestling, but just in America. I mean, it is the number one city that people around the globe, when they think of America, they think of New York City, for yeah. better or worse. And I, I just think it's got to be cool for you as a fan who – you know, grew up hitchhiking to go see your favorite wrestlers mm-hmm. there. Now here you are in the main event, in a title match, getting to do mic work in Madison Square Garden. Sold out? For the purposes of our story, okay, hanging okay. from the rafters, Hanging from the rafters. <laughs> uh, Taker defeats you in a lumberjack match to retain now this, this what, title. You know what I remember? I remember it was a lumberjack match because yes. Road Dog, to this day, swears that the chair shot the Undertaker hit me with to the back was the hardest chair shot he's ever seen. Because Undertaker had that giant wingspan and brother, you know, uh, you know, like just a, like a bolt of lightning down to my shoes, you know, putting me down to my knees legitimately. But we had a good match that night. The rest of those lumberjacks, Leaf Cassidy, <laughs> who we know. Okay. Also, Bob Holly. The Godwins, okay. Jesse James, Doug Furness, Phil LaFawn, and Rocky Mavia. All right. So Rocky at one point was, was a lumberjack, lumberjack for, for you. me. All right. Okay. Yeah. you, you got to remind him of that next time okay. you see him. You had 10,702 fans there. Uh, not a sellout. Not a sellout, but it was cl- 10, on the, on big the for ascension. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were ascending. Uh, before we move on. We got to at least address. I know you've told the story a few times, but the way we're getting to this sit down interview is Bruce understands this conversation you have with Shawn mm-hmm. Michaels. Apparently, he communicates that to Jim Ross and Vince and everybody else, and they decide, hey, let's replicate what we just did for Goldust and Marlena with the Mankind character. Is that pretty much it? Do we need the refresher uh, like. of the conversation between me and Sean? I think sure. it's important. I can cover it in about 90 seconds. Yeah. Sean and I were uh, having some really good house show matches. As a matter of fact, if I had only two house show matches, I really, truly wish that I had on on video. One would be Shawn Michaels at Madison Square Garden, and one was Bret Hart in either Manchester or Birmingham, UK, and it was just a cool house show match that worked backward from uh, the urn to the head at the very beginning of the match. It was like we took what should have been the ending, put it first, and worked backwards, and it I just like it just clicked. And I do wish I had a house show match with Vader. That was one of the most brutal matches I've ever had, and then it was just a house show match in the UK. No fan, a fan said to me years later, like only like a few years later, like I was at that match. He was again, either Birmingham or Manchester. He said, I looked at my friend and I said, I can't believe they're doing this to each other on a house show. And I said, that's funny because that's exactly what I was thinking. You know? <laughs> it was more of what he was doing to me. I think he was trying to break my nose on a house show. But it was, I, I at that point, I was just concerned about the quality of the matches. I, I kid you not. Uh, so anyway, Sean and I had some really good chemistry. It's a shame that off that great match we had at Mind Games in September 96 that we didn't get a shot to do pay-per-views again. 
But we were tearing it down and doing it while Sean had a back injury. Yeah. So I was, we were finding ways to make the matches highly entertaining, maybe not up to the level they would have been if he was healthy. They were still darn good, and, and he wasn't taking bumps. And he was sure. healing while he was wrestling, which is really difficult to do. So after one of those matches, at one of those venues, I don't know which one. It could have been the Garden, for all I know. Um, he says to me, don't take this the wrong way, but, and I've been around a long time, usually sentences don't end well with the words that begin with, don't take this the wrong way, but. He said, is this the way you always envisioned yourself? Mankind was really dark at that time. And then I laughed. I said, no, actually, I wanted to be you. And he looked at me kind of quizzically. I said, not Shawn Michaels. And then I told him about how I wanted to be the guy that the children idolize, the women love, the men, you know, want to aspire to be like. And that's when I told Sean, not knowing Bruce was listening, right. about dude love. And uh, Bruce goes to Vince, says Mick Foley has a much more interesting real life than the fictional mankind character. And he's got the video to prove it. And that really uh, put a light bulb over Vince's head. So he wanted to make that dream come true. So the next Raw is in Mobile, Alabama, the Civic Center down there. You're not wrestling on it, but you are announced as being a member of the King of the Ring tournament. Before we talk about what else happened on the show, I do want to bring up the King of the Ring. Because once upon a time, the King of the Ring was not a televised thing for the company. Uh, Then it became a televised thing. They crown Bret Hart. That starts the whole uh, feud with, with Lawler. Owen gets a shot. We build from there. But it did feel like the first guy who really made that a platform to launch into the stratosphere was 1996 with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, yeah. Austin 316. His career is never the same. He's working with Brett after that. He steals the show at WrestleMania. I'm sure some guys are taking note thinking, okay, there's the tag titles. There's the Intercontinental title. There's the world title. But now, maybe this King of the Ring thing actually matters a little yeah. more. And you're going to wind up being in the, in the finals of this one, and we're going to get there. But... Did you at the time think, man, King of the Ring could actually be a springboard to the next level? Or was that I more never, organic in the promo? Uh, yeah, I never thought, yeah, I, I never thought that titles were going to be coming my way. So, and then I would consider King of the Ring to be a title. Okay. As you're talking, I was just thinking of what a great job Owen Hart did. Phenomenal. Uh, as the King, and wondering if Austin hadn't cut that Austin 316 promo, would we have seen Stone Cold with with the scepter? Oh the, gosh! And the crowd for a year. Can you it imagine? Would, it wouldn't have been in keeping, right? Oh. And the, the Booker it was a great. It was a great king. Tremendous right? king. Because you sink your teeth into it and you play it for all it's worth. So sometimes the king is only worth what you put into it, right? Yes. Um, uh, so I I don't even think that was on my radar at the time. So along with the announcement for the King of the Ring is the first of your JR interviews. The Observer would write, they did an absolutely fantastic interview segment with Mankind, revealing him as Mick Foley, showing high school pictures of him, saying he used to be Cactus Jack, and totally turning him babyface. They're going to show clips of his winning King of the Death matches in uh, Japan next week. So I guess let's pause right there. Did you know when you first sat down to do the interview, this is going to make me a babyface? No. Because you know what the finish is. I do. The finish is going to be me attacking Jim Ross. So that doesn't feel like a babyface, but when we chop it up, right? well, it leans into the babyface yeah. a little bit there for a bit, doesn't it? It did. Uh, I remember Stone Cold driving with me the day after, uh, probably from Mobile to wherever we were going. He said, hell, kid, they turn your babyface. I said, uh, no, I think Vince just wants people to understand the character a little better. And Steve thinks about it for a second and says, he'll be a babyface in three weeks. And he was correct. So it was it was this real organic build that that was the turn. It was just m- every week more and more people were getting behind this character. They really empathized with mankind. So you wrote in your book, Kevin Dunn, who's the director of the Federation, came up while I was getting dressed and explained their concept, which involved appearing without the mask as Mick Foley. I actually liked the mask by this point and would wear it for several hours prior to a match. Now the damn thing smells so bad, I practically put it on while my music is playing. Mm-hmm. With believe- vapor rub, yeah. So. Really? That's oh, the- yeah, it was so bad. It was so rank, yeah. That's the key to get rid of it, just have something to overpower. Just have something overpowering. 
I believed in mankind and didn't want anyone to see the real Mick Foley just yet. So I came up with a game plan. I would tell the real life Mick Foley stories. I would give Mick Foley's opinions, but I would do it as mankind. In actuality, the two weren't that different. As in most cases, the most successful gimmicks were simply an amplified extension of a certain part of the real-life personality. I guess in that case, mankind was the insecure side of my personality, the side that never quite felt accepted. It was the side that surfaced in the Jim Ross interview, and it surfaced in a way that was both funny and touching, and it changed the way people felt about mankind. So, let's time out right there. All right, by now you know that uh, Mick and I both like to save money. He's Frugal McDougal, and I've been known to save a dollar or two. But let me give you a little pro tip on saving money, because that's the old thing we're looking for, right? It's like we've always heard. It's not how much you make, but how you save. Well, maybe you're like me, and you've fallen for a good deal here and there, or so we thought. Try it free for 30 days. Well, that's enough time to try it and then completely forget about it. I have to admit, I did this before Rocket Money. Rocket Money showed me all the subscriptions that I'd signed up for, and dude, I wasn't using a bunch of them. I had no idea that both my wife and I signed up for Hulu, but we watch TV together. We don't need two accounts. We needed one account. I even had a subscription that was very expensive to DAZN. I bought it over a year prior just to watch one fight and forgot about it. They just kept drafting, and I missed it. So let me ask you this. Do you know how much your subscriptions really cost? I thought I was spending like 80 bucks a month. Man, when it was all said and done, I was spending hundreds per month. It's time you find out exactly what you're spending with Rocket Money. You see, Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps you find and cancel all of your unwanted subscriptions. It's even going to help you monitor your spending and help you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have a subscription they forgot about. Maybe you signed up for the Stars app to watch one show, or maybe you got like a free gaming trial, but you never actually used it. That's where Rocket Money comes in. They will quickly and easily find the subscriptions for you. And any you don't want, man, you just hit cancel. Rocket Money does the rest for you. It's that easy. Rocket Money can also help you manage your finances in one place. You can automatically categorize your expenses so it's easy to track your budget in real time, and you'll get alerted if anything looks off. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money so far, saving the average person up to $720. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash Foley. That's rocketmoney.com slash Foley, rocketmoney.com slash Foley. I really like that you're just able to just be honest in your book and say, I wasn't let, ready to let everybody see Mick Foley yet. And mm -hmm. you were having success as mankind. Yeah. So the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, certainly applies here. But I do think it is a little different from the Goldust interview because Goldust was not in full gimmick. He didn't have the paint on. Right. So maybe they were thinking, well, let's just do exactly that. But you wanted a little twist on it. And I think because of that, it was better. I think so too. It's funny how with time you uh, you you tell the story <laughs> kind of as you wish it had happened. Yeah. Because in my mind, it was always a conversation. You know, in the past fifteen years or so, always a conversation with Vince pitching the idea, and me saying, "Hey, I've got a lot of work tied up in this thing. What if I do it? What, one, you know, one hundred percent honest, but doing the character of mankind." I recall Vince saying, you think you can do that, pal? And I went, oh, yeah, I, I know I can. Because I, I did believe in my ability to pull off some things as long as it wasn't physical. You know, I realized the limitations physically, but uh, I did believe that there was a lot to explore there with that character. And if uh, our fans are listening, they can nod to themselves. No one's going to judge you. Admit some of you. I scared the crap out of some of you when you were children, right? That 96, sure. 97 Mankind was dark. Uh, some people still haven't forgiven me for what I did to Undertaker in 96, although I'd argue he got his comeback in 98 for sure. Um, but that was a character I felt that would hadn't run its course and would not be better served by pulling the curtain completely open. So did you film these interviews in Stanford? Are they at the Stanford, studio? Stanford, it was done in one, you know, it was one interview. Yep. So Jim 
I don't know the questions. He didn't tell you ahead of he time. He didn't tell me ahead of time. You just had to freestyle answers. Uh, right. I mean, I may have been offered, but I didn't I didn't want to hear the questions. And, and then since uh, I didn't know the questions, JR has no idea how I'm going to respond. And it just took on this legitimate look of a real interview with a guy wearing a leather mask with divots uh, missing from his... So I love that you said you didn't want to know the questions. Uh, there's two schools of thought on that. One, there's the preparation side of all of us who say, well, I want to know because I want to make it good. Yeah. But then there's the other side that says, well, then it's going to look fake and it won't come off across, come yeah. across as real. Is that your thinking at the time? I don't want to know. Well, you know, in my experience with late night uh, talk shows, not just late night, but any talk show, uh, most of them are heavily produced. Yes. To the point where you're basically asked to regurgitate yes. a conversation you had with a producer and then uh there are a couple other shows you know like the daily show where they say uh, john likes to do a loose interview are you okay with that said, yeah they said, okay we'll see you on the side i was like that's it it's, it's so much easier and i think you know here's it's the same thing with scripted interviews you reduce the possibility of striking out um, but you also reduce the possibility of hitting a towering home run. Yes. And I, you know, I like when I started my career, I, I realized that I was well, kind of segueing in a sloppy way. But I was like, what if the strikeouts were just as exciting as the home runs? Like wow. Reggie Jackson. Remember back in the day when Reggie swung and missed, you knew it. Like he would probably corkscrew into the ground, you know, fall over. Like he was taking his swings there. And I just think that when, you know, whether it's a late night interview or whether it is um, uh, a wrestling interview, people can feel the difference. And and I, Jay, I think we would have probably hit a double, you know, a nice long, maybe a ground rule double, speaking metaphorically. But that night, instead, we hit a towering home run. I love the analogy of the strikeouts can be entertaining too because we've all seen maybe it's on one of the old Crockett shows like I'll never forget the first time I saw Ricky Morton do a live interview on TBS it's pretty bad <laughs> but then you can check back with him a year later yeah. man, he's got it down pat he's oh, yeah. comfortable he's feeling it but him having a bad interview was better than it just being an eh interview. Yeah. It's sort of like the, what I hear from wrestlers is, hey, it's okay if they cheer, it's okay if they boo, but you need a reaction. You need a reaction. The worst yeah. is just nothing. And so sometimes if, it, if it's not great and it's not awful, it's almost nothing to the audience. It's just yeah. sort of there. And I think we've seen a lot of... A lot of that. A, lo a lot of nothing. Yeah. So here's my another this another analogy. This is two, from 2007's Hardcore Diaries. I likened uh, you know the wrestling we see on a weekly basis to uh, like that rotate that <laughs> being in a, one of the sushi restaurants with the conveyor belt. Yeah. And you just come along. And it's like wow, I can get I can grab this. I can grab this, and it's all good. Uh, but it's not necessarily memorable. Yeah. It's not like sitting down with a homemade piece of grandma's pumpkin pie and you just want to savor every bite of it. Yes. So I was like, it's it's so quickly, so much of what we do is digested and forgotten that it becomes really difficult, but all the more important to give people those moments that they can remember. So when you're sitting down to do this interview, did, did you have... Uh, anything you were trying to accomplish in your mind, like if there's not, if you don't know the script, you don't know the questions he's going to ask. You know the quote unquote finish. You're going to attack J.O. Yeah. Do you know anything else? Like, hey, here's what I want to accomplish with this. Because you said you didn't really set out to do a baby face. No, I didn't. I just wanted to create something that was compelling. I felt like Jim was the perfect guy to do that with. Um, Did you have in your mind certain stories you wanted to share? No. Oh. Like, you knew they were going to show the dude love footage. You provided that. Right. Uh, but, like, the worms and all that, that was just... No, I don't think the worms, the story about the, having worms thrown at me on the schoolyard had ever crossed my mind. Um, you never thought in your head before the, those words fell out of your left. I was a good kisser. No, that uh, wasn't something. A lot of promos I did in my mind over and over, but sometimes they're just promos with some thoughts, and then you would tie, somehow tie them together as you went. Like that's a, you know, I I think wrestling. I think we're overlooked by the general public anyway. Um, 
but I think the idea that someone can start out with just an idea and hopefully a finishing line and take you on a three to five minute journey, sometimes yeah. longer, pretty brilliant, you know, especially if it's uh, helping people to buy tickets. But yeah. Sometimes it's just done as a, if you just look at it as a performance, they can be pretty exhilarating. Your voice inflection in the promo, uh, this is a character voice. Yeah. So you, you're really being cautious in, in the way you're doing your delivery. You're not just talking like you and I are right. now. There's highs, there's low, you're trying to draw people in. But that character almost felt like, to me, that voice probably lends itself to, like you said, a three to five minute thing. And now you're going to carry it on for a longer period of time. Was that a concern of yours? No. Am I going to be able to keep this act up and make it compelling and interesting and not monotonous? I mean, I may have seen it as a challenge, but, you know, we think we like those challenges. Of course. You know, although we only usually break it out for the cameos. Yeah. I can take us on a little stroll. Let's do it. Down memory lane. Okay, so uh, this will not be the worm story. This will be uh, the uh, this will be the the lacrosse story. Okay, okay. Uh, unlikely goalie, but it was a you know, tough sport. I know it's kind of maligned as like the preppy sport, but it's a physical game. And as a goalie, especially like in middle school, before the the uh, the. the players are adept enough to get in the corners most of the time. You're taking a lot of the shots. Those are the heaviest. I know this is rife with, you know, the heaviest of all balls, right? I mean, it's the densest. It's yeah. a lacrosse ball. It's something that uh, therapeutically can use, therapeutically can be used to rub on the soles of your feet. Wow. Yeah, because of the, the depth. So, so anyway, when you get hit with one of those, especially if you don't have a cup. So I'm put, setting it up that I was the slowest guy. I don't know if I said this, but I was the slowest guy on the team by far. And to aid myself in running laps, I would take out my protective cup. When I ran, I usually remembered to put it back. And on this day, I didn't. And I suffered the ultimate price for that. So I'm going to take you there in a... Jimmy, I went down like I'd been shot. It was the only time I remember... Girls looking at my genital area. I showed up that next day even though my testicle was the size of a grapefruit. And for that reason, I considered that day to be the greatest day in the history of my life. Because they were looking at my genitals, right, for the first time. So we, when that episode airs, uh, Vince then says... Going into, he goes, we're going to hear for more from mankind. Uh, should be uh, interesting considering the story about his testicle. And that was the first time Vince had said the T word on TV. I may have been the guy who broke that wall for all of us, you know, wow. because I go back to like as a student of television and radio uh, history, uh, St. Elsewhere had a story on testicular cancer and they couldn't even say the word. The kid had to say something real bad down there, like they never actually said the word. So here I am just shattering that wall, and now Vince is like a guy with a new toy. And so the testicles. testicle became his thing. And then all of a sudden, I go from the guy who literally had a testicle the size of a grapefruit to Vince taking being the guy with the grapefruit. So... Uh, I know it's old hat, and you There's do There's a WrestleMania angle there, right? I can't get over you just put the mask on and did it so well. <laughs> As a fan, that was really cool to see. Thanks, thanks. Uh, just, you have that down pat. The shifting of the eyes, all that. You could just turn it on, turn it off. But everyone watching at home was thinking the same thing I am. How cool is this? He's doing this right is now. Is it cool enough that I you forgive me for messing up my own line? Yes. Because it's supposed to be that the, you know... It's supposed to be the girls looking the next day when I came back. After, all right, okay, okay. We were so focused on your performance. <laughs> Thank you. We Thank missed you, it. I appreciate that. Uh, part it's two. not going to take away from my cameo, is it? No. Okay. We're going to get that at the end. They specifically, I 14, uh, someone asking for for the 14 year old, which is why I'm not doing my version of WAP. Uh, oh, no WAP? Today. No, I've, I wrote some of the lyrics down, and it's uh, come along well. Um, Do you just travel with cue cards? <laughs> it's 
birthday boy in the house, birthday boy in the house. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's going to be pretty good. Uh, I, I, I need to get in the zone just one of these days, just, just break it out. But I was working on it last night. Yeah, dude, singing about a happy-ass birthday. I was thinking hard about your happy-ass birthday. Gonna get a card for your happy-ass birthday. So we're working on it. But I don't think that's appropriate for a 14-year-old. No, you know, I agree. Uh, yeah, so you we're going to... You do a WAP remix yeah, no, no, no. for a 14-year-old. So somebody out there wants the WAP remix, ask for the WAP remix. Could we do a WAP remix as Mankind? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, 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 of course we can, yeah. yeah. My birthday's in June. Uh, all right. Uh, so someone listening... My- <laughs> <on that. laughs> so, so part two of this interview airs uh, while Raw is in Evansville. Um it's just tremendous. We've got the links below. Go out of your way to see them. That night on Raw, we see Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels team up to become the new unlikely tag team champions. They beat Owen and Davey Boy. Uh, this whole Austin Hart thing is really picking up some steam. How much of an impact was Vince Russo having on creative at the time? Was this really like the height of his run, you think? Or maybe the rise of Vince Russo is a better word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was a big part of it. Um, I mean, there's a great video backstage of... Uh, with the dude. With the dude. And then Vince trying to teach me how to, I'm not going to make you strut. I said, I was strutting. So, so I got now Vince McMahon teaching me how to strut. And Russo clearly had a lot of pull, and he did. He had great ideas, and I really, uh, he believed in mankind, you know, and I really, uh, I believed in him, not to sound corny, but I thought he was a guy with great ideas. You know, I don't know why he's become such a polarizing figure, because he, he helped so much of that product in that era and folks who deny it to me i mean it's just a little silly yeah. like he did have some great ideas. i can defend vince russo with one word yurple yeah. you know, yurple was a real life birthday party clown but it was russo's idea to get a birthday party clown so i know we're not here talking about this is your life but i remember him pitching me that idea and i said is she gonna have the shoes like the overgrown shoes oh bro she's gonna have the shoes and didn't know that that would go on to be uh, where your blonde and I are still in touch to this day. Really? Still trying to tell me this, all right? Um, maybe we can do this at one of your events in the future. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I think I am thinking what I think. Wait, let me put the mankind mask on. <laughs> I think I am thinking what I think you think I think you're thinking. Yeah, still got it. I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> we got to get your pull. What we want to do is turn, it's just a specialty photo. It doesn't have to connect and resonate with everyone because everyone can understand. Boom, come in, yeah. take your picture. Guys got the hand on the shoulder, right? Uh, what I want to do, recreate that hospital room. Oh, wow. And then instead of standing in the middle of Mankind in your pool, or man in a Mankind mask in case there's Climb a copyright issue, bed. you're in the hospital bed. You yeah. put on the gown, right? And we got, you know, we got a bedpan. And, and, and let them hold the bedpan. Yeah, let them hold the bedpan and boom, photo, out. We do a hundred of those. I love it. It's pretty good, right? I love it. I, don't get me wrong. I'd like to make money. Grillo, give me a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. Do you think so. your pool's available for such a book? I, you know what? I tried calling your pool. Uh, I left a message uh, before I did uh, an event in Missouri, and she didn't get back to me. Yurple's big league in you. you, you man, could, <laughs> could, <laughs> get big league by Yurple. <laughs> so if anyone out there knows Yurple, uh, you could look it up under JoJo and Yurple's Fun Time Palace, and it could be in Texarkana. Last known address for Yurple was... Texarkana. We gotta find the airport. Do you have any friends in Arkansas? I, I do. Okay. As a matter of fact, our, our mutual friend Stan. Stan's in Arkansas. Stan's in Arkansas. So, but Stan's an investigative reporter, right? Yeah. NEAReport.com. All right, Stan, get to work on the Yurpol situation. Dude, if Stan could bring us Yurpol, we could get a fake Yurpol, but we would know, right? Well, yeah, we're not getting a fake Mankind. No, no. I mean that's the legit Mankind mask, right? Wink, wink. Yes, it is. Yes, yep. of course. Uh, let's talk about the whole Brett Sean situation. Yeah. You know, they were originally supposed to be hooking it up at King of the Ring. We know that's not going to happen. Um, Brett's going to be injured. He's going to be doing some promos from a wheelchair. They're going to go a little long. Shawn Michaels was supposed to super kick him before it went off. Brett missed his cue. There's some hurt feelings. Eventually it bubbles over and there's a fight in the back. At this point in 1997, how many times do you think you've probably seen a fight in the back? 
handful of times? Five, yeah, I was thinking five. So it's not that common no. where it bubbles over like this. But this one didn't feel like, hey, man, somebody got potatoed in the ring. And, and this has been brewing for a long time. These guys just do not like each other. Was that common knowledge? Are we able to talk about, uh, you know, I mean, I, we got it's the sunny days. It's the Sunny Days comment. That Sunny didn't Days help comment that sends. I wasn't aware. I was aware there was a not, you know, a healthy competition there, and I think there should be. But it was to me, it wasn't like it was a. They were on eggshells. To me, it, it was the Sunny Days thing that that instantly created that. That took it from wrestling to real life. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Just to add context, I'm sure some of our listeners don't remember, but Sean did an interview where he's uh, in the ring, Brett's in the backstage area, and Sean says something like, I know you've been enjoying some sunny days. Yeah. Sonny, of course, at the time was the most downloaded celebrity in, in all of AOL and certainly the hottest diva in WWE. She was uh, in a relationship with Chris Candido, and Bret Hart was married to his lovely wife, Julie, at the time. Shawn Michaels was single and ready to mingle and allegedly had been enjoying some sunny days, depending on who you believe. But when the accusation went the other way towards a married man, all of a sudden, Bret, who has a wife and kids at home, and all the kids are watching the product, that's probably not the best environment to no, go home to. No. And that feels like it probably crossed a line as far as just uh, man code and wrestler code, even if it were true, and we don't know, and no. it doesn't really matter. But you don't say that on TV. Right. Did no. you feel like Sean took it too far? Yeah. Everybody agreed with that? I think so. So when it came time for these guys are going to come to blows, and allegedly a lot of this was over he said, she said, for I won't put you over, or you won't put me over. In the end, this is real life. Hey, that dude's messing with my family. Yeah. Right? So I didn't see the fight. Everybody um, heard about it, though. Everybody heard about it. I was there in the aftermath, and uh, Sean said it was an unsafe working condition. Storms out. Storms out. And I remember Corny telling me, if not that day, then the next TV taping that my ship had just come in. That, uh, you know, the Shawn Michaels, uh, because up until then, I, you know, the love handle was going to be dude loves finish, right? So, so I know we're jumping around here, but suffice to say, uh, the, the um, promo with Jim Ross goes over so well that Vince calls me on the phone, we're living down in the Florida panhandle, so I'm on Central Time, rare day off, because we're working pretty steadily, really steadily. Um, and he calls me at around 6 a.m., which is 7 a.m. Eastern. Hey, pal, how'd you like to be dude love? And I said, one time, and he said, from now on. Like, the idea of bringing that character to life and allowing me to live that dream, that's why he loves doing that. Yeah, people can say what they want about Vince. Vince is wholeheartedly believes in the dream and making those dreams come true. And I've seen him do it, you know, for, for you know, for someone uh, really struggling, you know, with uh, with life-threatening illness. And we talked uh, uh, several weeks ago about a young man named Marcos, who I was able to bring into the ring and help create this really special day. But you don't do it without Vince's blessing. So he does believe wholeheartedly in that. He wanted me to live out that dream of becoming Dude Even if Love. it wasn't necessarily for you, he wanted the audience to see. Yeah, yeah, that, Hey, yeah. you can do this too. Dreams right. can come true. Right. And I mean, it's a great story for the audience and, of course, fun for you too. Now, is this at the time, uh, there's also this uh, storyline where Steve is looking for a partner. Is this is uh, so when, when the whole thing happens with Sean? Yeah, but we're going to get there. But okay, yes, you're okay. on the right track. All right, so I don't become I'm not dude yet, but we want to we ha want to have a moment. Yeah, it supposedly yes. puts uh, uh, mankind over the edge, and I'm showing up on a weekly basis, uh, helping Steve fighting off his foes and basically getting stunned. And, uh, you know, get it. so getting like the door slammed in my face because Austin's a loner, wants no part of mankind. And uh, and it's good TV on a weekly basis. And I'm taking some serious shots, too. Yeah. Right? Like this is uh, Steve is nothing is going to put a dent in Steve's armor as far no. as being the top guy. Uh, so it's not hurting him. It's only enhancing that character to be uh, d d stunning poor mankind. But simultaneously, people are building up this empathy for him. Yes. 
So you remember Cornette calling you and saying, hey, your ship's come in. Yeah. And it was because of the 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 Shawn Michaels absence at the time. Yeah. So I think what was happening is these interviews are getting over to yeah. the point where Steve asks me after week one in my turning baby face, predicts I'll be a baby face by week three, which I was, and now the company's going to invest in me uh, in part because Sean is gone, and that leaves a, a big hole in the lineup. Does your uh, financial brain uh, even consider, or is it just your wrestling brain? When it comes to being a heel, we've heard every wrestler say, "Ah, oh, it's just more fun to be a heel," and I get that. Yeah. But it's also pretty fun to get a bigger check, and if you're selling a bunch of merch, you probably get a bigger check as a babyface, right? And and mankind would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jr. Well, has said on his podcast that Austin, at his height, was getting million dollar quarterlies just from t-shirts. Yeah, and we're not there yet, but we're cruising there because that Austin 316 shirt, even yeah. though it's not beating Nitro, it's picking up a lot of steam. Yeah, and people are really resonating. I mean, that's really resonating with a lot of folks, and they're they're voting with their wallets. But as a heel, that's probably not a regular part of your diet at that point. But if you think, wow, a babyface character. That might not be bad for the old well, wallet. Keep my, unless it's Austin or one of these, inc- you know, incredibly popular shirts, WWE has a royalties in a way that you're making a little bit here, off action figures there, off videos there. It all it's not kind substantial. Of, you're it's saying. yeah, it wasn't that substantial. I never felt like there's a big difference. But as far as having fun, I. You know, almost like when you become that baby face, you are a somewhat diluted heel ver- version of your heel self. Yes. Whereas I was able to expand mankind and bring dude love to the forefront and have Cactus Jack come in. So I think I had more fun. And also, I don't, I mean, being mankind was difficult because it was different. I mean, I, I just said in that book that it was close to my heart. Parts of it were close to my heart as far as being the outsider, but as far as being the the dark guy, you know, who doesn't interact, and that was difficult uh, the, the, to be that dark, especially as I did not want mankind to be Cactus Jack with a mask. So right. create this backstory. The backstory is pretty dark, the boiler room thing. I play it up, pre- I think, pretty well to very well, depending on the night. And so I had a lot of fun as, as babyface mankind. Part of you know, when get, we get into 98, uh, the latter end of 98, my knees start really bothering me. And I start having to rely more on character stuff than, than the in-ring stuff. It bothers me at the time. Now I look back at it as one of the greatest times of my career because yeah. we had so much fun with the character. Flair said that when his physical skills started to diminish, he just had to up the entertainment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the key to longevity in yeah. wrestling, though, is it not? Every, I think he, the exceptions would prove the rule, which is the guys who don't find a way to shift into a different gear, which is largely upping the entertainment and you know, they're by the comedy. Uh, they're the ones who do much better, and the guys who don't find a way to do that end up floundering. Yeah, no kidding. So The Undertaker is going to join with Paul Bear that night on Raw, and later that week on Shotgun, you team with Vader and Taker to take on the Nation of Domination. Um, so I, so a couple months after uh, Revenge of the Taker, I'm now teaming with Taker, who does a heel turn of his own. Yeah, he's okay. joining Paul Bear because he doesn't want this secret to come out. Okay, gotcha. About gotcha. Kane. Gotcha. Uh, and you're working the loop with Rocky in between TVs. Uh, this is the very young Rocky Mavia. He's not yet with the nation. He doesn't have this heel edge. Are you seeing progression? As I mean, it seems silly that we're talking about it in this way, but he's still relatively green. He's a new guy, and you're the veteran at this point. Could you see him improving week to week, or did you guys have like here's our standard match and we're going to do? No, we we I always enjoyed working with him. He was a hard worker, always looking to get better, and he was a natural. He was one of you know Austin. I would say was a natural. Kurt Angle and uh, and The Rock were the three guys I saw just picked it up. But it was not until he said the words to me, when once he started referring to himself in third person, all right, that starts, it gets, it's not just starting to get over, it, it is over. But the moment he turns to Farouk and says, I think he even said with all due respect, the fans want to hear what The Rock has to say. And we all, all of us watching the monitor went, ooh, like, 
Ooh, like they, he was really on to something. And all he needed was that little something. And, uh, you know, he's talked about, uh, I mean, it did bother him that fans turned on him. Yeah. The die Rocky, die chance. You got to take that personally, How right? How could you not? Because he's, uh, he's, uh, he is portraying a character who is very close to himself, right? He's, well, he's also uh, doing exactly what the office has told him yeah, to do. Yeah, and it's not working. And then when he starts doing things his way, it does start working. Yeah. And so that was night and day. But we would have, I, I, I don't, we got the one star or one and a quarter, I think. Or was just one star. I said we, we should have earned one and a quarter. I thought, <laughs> personally, I thought uh, Cold Day in Hell was a one and a half star match and that we were robbed of that half star. We're going to get a, we're going to get a hashtag trending about that. <laughs> get, get Meltzer to acquiesce. In Huntington, you defeat Savio Vegas. You're going to advance in the King of the Ring tournament. But the real story is part three of your interview, they show clips of the King of the Death Match yeah. from the IWA. Meltzer would say this. They did another Mankind segment, mainly showing his gimmick matches from Japan, and also showed an ECW clip of his farewell, talking about how he had so much respect as Cactus Jack, and he doesn't have any as Mankind. It was great again. He should be an actor on television rather than a pro wrestler with the way he can <laughs> deliver a line. This may be a way to build up the first explosive barbed wire match in WWF history later this year, since Atsushi Onita has talked about wanting to do that match in Madison Square Garden. Now that is a fun sidebar, because there is in this era a famous picture of Onita mating with Vince in the WWF headquarters. Did you have any idea that that was happening? No, no, I did not. Wouldn't that have been something uh, to think you it. and Onita as mankind and Onita in the WWF? I, I would have loved it. I remember in 98 pushing for that match with me and Terry Funk, something on an island where we didn't have to worry about the explosions or anyone around ringside getting hurt. Uh, I, I It was a cinematic match before there was a cinematic match, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the idea of it being remote where you couldn't go and see it or anything like it, I thought would be a draw. And we've done, you know, things Floating like, rings like FMW yeah, yeah. or Spring Break Nitro, whatever. And to break this out, the exploding barbed wire match in the United States, I think would have been a, a great deal. It would have been tremendous. Were you surprised that they were able to show that footage? I mean, the idea that we saw that footage on WWF programming, I mean, you go back to like that new generation era where it's Doink and Bastion Booger and yeah. Jeff Jarrett with the with uh, the, the, suspenders. the the stripper gimmick and it, it it's uh, quite the departure to now we're seeing explosions on Raw yeah, right yeah um I, I it's it's such a I don't know it's so cool of Vince to be able to pivot he realizes he's getting his butt kicked in the ratings he's got to do something different but the idea that he's showing footage from other promotions. Yeah. They think they just they found out who had the the rights to it. Yeah, uh, I think they had a, a pretty good working relationship with ba Baseball Magazine, which was the number one wrestling magazine for reasons I still don't understand. A Japanese magazine calling itself Baseball about it doesn't make sense to me. Um, but neither did the fact that they'd have naked pictures of women in their versions of like Time and Newsweek. So right. a lot about the culture I still don't understand. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank there. You wanna? <laughs> well, it's just crazy to me that, that Vince is embracing showing other promotions. I didn't actually draw a blank. I was thinking of some of the vile things that they would you show in some of their magazines, pointing it out. Oh, my God, it was a fetish magazine. I, I sold it. Oh, my God. Oh, geez. And I don't want to say who the wrestler is, but he's not here anymore. Like, Isn't that awful? And all I heard was, <laughs> I said, isn't that gross? <laughs> so, okay. So, hey, you know. It, Was there a squid own. involved? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Glad to hear it. All right, boys and girls, let's take a time out to talk about a great new sponsor we have here on the program, Mood. And, man, they have something I didn't even believe was real, THCA flower. That's right. Mood is known for their federally legal THC but now they're adding their most potent product yet to the lineup, introducing the hemp based THCA flower, the future of legal THC. Try it along with all of Mood's other amazing offerings like Delta 8 flower, gummies, vape cartridges, and more. And for a limited time, Mood is giving our listeners a free gram of THCA flower and 20% off your first order. Just visit hellomood.com and use our code Foley 
I have to admit, this was new to me. I am a rookie. I am not a veteran in this game like our pal Jim Ross, but I was so excited to try it and to check it out. And let me tell you, the person who benefited the most might actually be my wife. I think I mentioned it before. She's training to do some fitness modeling stuff. And man, she's just run herself ragged. She hadn't been sleeping well until mood. She took one of their phenomenal gummies and man, she had the best sleep of her life. We are really sold on this product. I think you're going to enjoy it too, but THCA man, here's what I've learned about this. THCA flower is perhaps mood's latest and most potent breakthrough in the world of legal cannabis. You see THCA I'm learning converts into THC when you heat it. So you get that classic, well, you know, euphoria high. And Mood has 10 other high inducing strains, the most potent they've ever offered. They put an end to guessing games at Mood because they have federally legal forms of THC that have been extracted from hemp plants. All of their products are regularly third party tested in drug enforcement agency registered labs. They're also sourced from small family farms and then grown organically. How about that? The experts at Mood have tested and tailored different strains for specific moods from euphoria to energize to creative to chill something for everybody whatever mood you're looking for they got you covered however you take your thc mood can handle it i mentioned i was a beginner our old pal jr he's a vet i enjoy the great tasting gummies i know my man jr loves the classic flower old dave green likes a convenient pre-roll there's something for everybody try moods new thca flower and get 20% off your first order and a free gram of THCA flour. Just go to hellomood.com and use the promo code Foley. That's hello M O O D.com. The promo code Foley for 20% off your order and a free gram of THCA flour. Uh, you're matching Huntington against Savio Vega. It's the first time I remember you getting a big baby face pop. When you come through the curtain, now your, your old pal Steve Austin, he said, you'll be a baby face in three weeks. Yeah. The episode where uh, the third interview airs, you come out to wrestle Savio Vega, there's a baby face yeah. pop. Were you surprised or were you like, damn it, he was right? Or are you at this point excited, like, okay, that's a new challenge? I'd actually been feeling it on a nightly basis. So then you could feel the injection. You felt it on house shows. We just yeah, saw it there yeah, for the first time. Yeah. Are you happy at that point with the transition it feels like your character is making? Or yeah. because you've been so dark. Yeah, I feel because, first of all, it's more me. Yes. Uh, they were getting behind me. Uh, based on things that were 100% true, you know, I mean, I like it, it's nice that uh, people thought I did a good performance, but I'm saying things that I 100% believe in. And so this is a character people think they can get behind. This is where people start to see a little bit of themselves in this lighter mankind. You know, he's not, he hasn't lightened up much yet but they see a little light at the end of that tunnel. So who are you most excited to see your swollen testicle? <laughs> if it's all real, there was some girl you're like, I hope so-and-so sees it. Well, it was just rumored. Test uh, <laughs> that grapefruit. And they like, no, more like a tangelo. No, grapefruit. Yeah, grapefruit. So, uh, this part four of this interview series is actually supposed to air after King of the Ring. Okay. At the actual pay-per-view, you're scheduled for two matches. The first is with Jerry Lawler. Yeah. You're going to get the win in 10 minutes and 24 seconds with the mandible claw. No Paul Bear with you because you're a baby face. Uh, and Meltzer would say, he's gone back to his Cactus Jack bang bang trademark mm. now that he's a face. Actually, this was not a good interview, made even worse by the lack of crowd reaction and the fact that 10,000 in, in the building, the only person seemingly reacting was Vince McMahon. He was laughing at the humor that nobody seemed to either understand this or is my, was my funny. promo? Yes. No, not, not, not part four, but the King of the Ring promo beforehand. No, I don't remember. There were some cheers for Mankind as he came out, but almost no baby face pop or reaction uh, to his... Um, uh, to his interview, Lawler came out and insulted the fans and did a monologue with all old jokes, blah blah blah. Either way, after a messed up neckbreaker spot, Lawler hit a first drop, or a fist drop, and then went for a pile driver. But Mankind powered out and hit the mandible claw for the win, a star in three quarters. Um, of course, Lawler at this point, you know, it's weird to read the Observer back then. He's talking about uh, Lawler at 47 as if he's way over the hill. 
of our favorite wrestlers are jumping off balconies in their 60s, and we're great with it now. Uh, but Lawler here, was this a, a fun experience for you growing up a guy who had such great respect for wrestling and you knew what Lawler was? Now, he might not be at his physical peak in 47, but as a guy who was growing up loving it, it had to be exciting to you. It was exciting to the point where, I don't know, it makes for good TV for me to find a, a photo. Well, I'll find it while I'm talking. Yeah, I, ever since I saw Lawler in that um, uh, Letterman thing, he'd been someone I really liked. And as I got to know uh, uh, Brian Hildebrandt and Mark Curtis exposed me more and more to the... Uh, He's a super uh, Lawler fan. Super Lawler fan. I, I will, we'll make sure we put it in. It's me uh, getting a character caricature done in 1983 where I was calling myself the big guy. I wanted to be... I, I should sue Ryback over that, right? You should. The big guy. And... Um, and I've got the Lawler uh, crown goatee with no mustache. Yeah, how about yeah. that? So, so it was cool. I did mess up that neck breaker. To this day, I find that a really difficult move because you don't know which way Is he going a, that way a guy's way? going. And um, yeah, I've messed that move up a handful. I never really of times. thought about that, but I've always, you know, we know that here in America, guys work the left side, but there's not a no. no. You always go left or go right. Yeah, some guys do it differently. Yeah, and it's a yeah. I just I know that sounds crazy. So it's one of the more difficult moves. Once you know which way you're going, it's not difficult. Yeah, but uh, it's difficult to get a feel. So I did mess up that spot. So it's not necessarily a matter that you and Lawler didn't just click. You just think it was just that one spot? No, maybe we didn't click. Uh, it's one of those matches that gets mired in the middle where I, uh, I don't have a recollection of it. I certainly don't remember flopping an interview that badly. Uh, well, that's just like Meltzer's opinion, man. Uh, t <laughs> talk to me about Bang Bang, though, because you were very clear a minute ago saying, I didn't want yeah. mankind to be Cactus Jack with a mask. But now at this point... We've acknowledged that you used to be Cactus yeah. Jack, and you really long to be Dude Love. Uh, is this where we maybe see for the first time there are going to be different faces of Foley? Because you're embracing... Well, I think if persona. I was doing the Bang Bang, I wasn't banking on there being three. I didn't... I mean, I was. I had been told Vince said Cactus Jack will never step foot inside. That came, I think, from Bruce. Yeah. Uh, never stepped foot inside a WWF ring. So even if he was going to give life to Dude Love, uh, there was never a breath about it until September of 97. I know you're not Vince, so you don't know. But why do you think Vince would have said that? Because he didn't like that once upon a time the character had the last name Manson? <laughs> or because he wanted to own it? I, I know this is, this is before I was even with the company. Right. This is Bruce... Um, I, I remember running into Bruce at LaGuardia Airport. Maybe I was with WCW or maybe I was independent by that time. Um, and it was only years later, Bruce said, do you know Vince was with me at LaGuardia? And I said, hey, do you want to meet Cactus Jack? He said, I don't think I ever want to meet him. And then said that he would never step foot in a WWF ring. He didn't like the character. He thought it was sleazy. He thought that I was sleazy. And maybe that's a compliment to the character that he thought, well, this is an awful human being. I think if he paid any attention to the character, and I do think a, a, a knock on Vince for me would be, if he's micromanaging everything, which he does, then maybe he could spend an hour here or there studying a little a video so that a guy with 12 years behind him doesn't show up and get judged solely on what one man sees on a 13-inch TV screen. I think he's at least changed his stance a little bit. I mean, I don't know that I would have... I was a huge fan of Kevin Steen, but I don't know that I would have seen... Kevin having the success in oh, WWE yeah, yeah. because it felt like not what Vince was looking for. I think uh, someone came around and knocked down the door. As I wonder far who as that would who be. That could have been as to what a WWE superstar could look like. And he even broke the barrier for testicles when you think about <laughs> that it. That guy was amazing. Uh, now we're going to the big finish here for the King of the Ring. Helmsley and you are going to go 19 minutes and 26 seconds. Helmsley is going to win the King of the Ring tournament. Uh, Meltzer says there was no heat at all for the first half of the match, despite the fact that the work itself was solid. 
Uh, to the fans, at least, the two worked so hard that it got the crowd into the match. But this was seen as an unworthy final match. Mm. The second half of the match built to a very good match, mainly through Mankind taking crazy bump after crazy bump and the announcers attempting to paint a portrait of him putting on one of the most courageous performances in history. The match just didn't reach that level. There were even boring, loud chants at times. Mankind hit a couple of hot shots for near falls. Helmsley took a flip into the buckles and later a backdrop on the concrete floor. Mankind did his elbow off the apron, onto the concrete, onto Helmsley. Mankind hit the double arm DDT, but China distracted the ref from counting the fall. Helmsley went for the pedigree, but Mankind powered out. Mankind got the mandible claw on, but China pulled Mankind off Helmsley and out of the ring by the hair. Helmsley pulled off Mankind's mask, revealing, well, Cactus Jack, of course. Mankind got in and put on the claw, but this time Helmsley broke it with fingers to the eyes. Mankind came back with a reverse atomic drop, did his running clothesline, where both take the bump over the top rope, and Mankind missed a falling elbow off the apron when China pulled Helmsley out of the way, and Mankind hit his head on the guardrail. What a sick thud that was. I remember that one. Helmsley whipped Mankind into the steps, gave him a pedigree, through McMahon and Ross's announcer's table. China then broke the scepter they were going to use in the coronation on Mankind's back. Mankind even took the nesty plunge off the apron where he cracks his head on the floor. All the effect was weakened because he actually crashed into photographer Tom Buchanan instead of the floor. Finally in the ring, Helmsley finished him with the pedigree, and after the match, Helmsley destroyed Mankind with his crown, so the gimmick seems to be King Hunter and Queen China. Mankind crawled back to the dressing room on his hands and knees. Three and a half stars. I think it's a badass match. I think it's criminally underrated. I still remember that guardrail spot. But I'm curious in your head, what were you thinking on the Nest T plunge? And there's a photographer there. Man, it's a funny thing because to this day, I can remember every single thing that happened with me and Triple H at um, New York. Uh, this New York City street fight, yep. Royal Rumble 2000, everything that happened in uh, the, the subsequent month with the uh, fall, um, Hell in a Cell. I don't remember that match. I, I remember it was good, and I do specifically remember if there had been a problem with Mankind getting the babyface reaction before then, that at the house shows especially, um, and I would say also at the at the arena shows, you know, when when all those uh, videos had reached their completion, that babyface reaction was not an issue. That we were getting great reactions. I mean, there, there's a story Hunter and I like to share. Either, you know, not a one of not one of the great wrestling stories, but just me feeling that response from the crowd, making my comeback and going, "This is great." Like, it was so much fun to get that kind of reaction. Bigger, uh, I'd had some nice baby face reactions as Cactus Jack during my run, but this was, I'd say, the best pure baby face reaction. And, uh, that, you know, we're trying to figure out what a guy with limited offense can do for his comeback. And I, we decide, or I decide, Hunter decides one comeback. It's not going to be a series of smaller comebacks and cutoffs that when mankind makes that comeback, it's going to be a big one. Then I throw into the loop that, okay, I hit one or two moves, and now I go into that, you know, uh, seated position, rocking. The here, rock. here comes the hair, boom. We <sighs> blow the hair, and then up to do the next few moves. And that was unique. No one had done anything remotely like that for their... Uh, Mankinding up. Yeah, man kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. Like I, yeah, I guess I could have, like, taken off the shirt, and but nobody wants to see that. Trust me. Nobody <laughs> nobody wants to see that. So it was, it was, you know, you're discovering things as you go. You're throwing stuff at the wall. You don't know what's going to hit and what's going to stick. And it turned out that some of that stuff stuck. This lie. Not saying this to be funny, not laughing when I say it. Do you think you don't remember the match because you hit your head on the guardrail? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Do, do, you, do you remember ever seeing that hit where you hit your no. guardrail? It's brutal. Uh, I think I've only seen the match once, probably the, that next day in catering, and I probably haven't seen it since then. Uh, I'm glad you say it's criminally underrated, though. Well, it's really good because, uh, you know, first of all, the announce table spot at that point was not overdone. So that was a big yeah, spot. Yeah, yeah. Your head on the guardrail was a big spot. Jumping off the apron with the elbow and missing is a big spot. The nasty plunge is a big spot. But the thing that a lot of people miss is the way Hunter continued to get the heat on you after. Now, allegedly, the, uh, Hunter wanted no part 
of being saddled with wearing that dumb cape and crown <laughs> and scepter. So he destroyed it, and that was not the plan. They had Ooh. another one recreated. He destroyed that one, too. But supposedly, this was like the bane of Bruce's existence because Vince really wanted him to do it. Hunter wanted no part. And I'm assuming, based on you laughing, you did not know that Hunter was supposed to wear that, and you just went along with it. Like, yeah, okay. yeah. But I'm thinking, while you're saying that, that he's a, he's a uh, can I get blue blood? He would have been a natural. But he didn't want to do that anymore. Okay. You know, he, he wants right. to have this hardened edge. Yeah, yeah. He wants to. We're, we're not quite to DX, but we're not too far away. Right. So he wants to be this badass ass kicker now with China, as opposed to her coming out in a goofy queen outfit. Uh, so I get that, but I, th I think it's cool that he kind of, according to Bruce, as they say, went into business for himself and destroyed that stuff. But the little touch of, you know, let's think back a little bit to WrestleMania 13, when Austin is down and out and he's passed out, and then, you know, afterwards, Brad attacks him. And ultimately, he wants no help to the back. He fights off help. He stuns a referee, and he limps back to the back on his own. That's like out of an old cowboy movie. Yeah, yeah. And here you are crawling back on your hands and knees. That's a really cool touch. I don't think I remember ever seeing anyone in wrestling before that crawling to the back on their hands and knees. Is that a Foley touch? Is that a Pat Patterson touch? Do you recall? I'm not sure. I do remember seeing uh, Sergeant Buddy Lee... Uh... Buddy Lee Parker? Buddy Lee Parker crawling uh, down the ramp during Battle Bowl because uh, he, uh, Buddy had been selected as my partner. Abdullah didn't get that why I would need another partner. So he came down. <laughs> Just some great light comedy. Yes. Abdullah had a flair for, for some, he had some comedic gestures. And the idea that in his mind, I'm always going to be his partner. Yes. And he he laid a beat down on Buddy Lee Parker, and then so Abdullah was escorted away. But I essentially took on Steamboat and Private Time Champion on my own. And then when Buddy came down on his hands and knees, the people really got behind that. And then he was beaten like as soon as he got in the ring, he was beaten. So I think I was discovering my inner Buddy Lee Parker by the crawl to the back. I think it's great. I thought it was really really good. Underrated. Uh, in your opinion, is this the first great match you had with Hunter? I mean, we remember the when Cactus Jack comes back at MSG and all the great ones that you listed, but this is probably the first really good one to me. Well, good is a matter of perspective. Sure. Because I remember Jim Ross telling me when Hunter and I started working around the loop, uh, JR was booking us in some Falls Count Anywhere matches. And he was concerned, as I still, you know, the back was still a question. And uh, I'm you know, Mick, really sorry about this. We're going to get you off of these things as soon as we can. I said, Jim, do you want me to be healthy? He said, yes. I said, book me in as many of these Falls Count Anywhere matches as you can because a Falls Count Anywhere match can be anything you want it to be. And Hunter and I would do, we'd get a great amount of you know, mileage out of a pair of salad tongs, right? Salad tongs to the genitals. And then there was the one night when uh, I've got the salad tongs, Hunter's climbing up that uh, top rope and he tells me to beal him. I grab him by the nose, right? And I hear him beal, <laughs> beal throw. It's like, <laughs> you know, the big exaggerated, so it's like casting a fishing line. With that. I love it. And he would take the big bump. And so we were having a lot of fun getting a great crowd reaction, but not having that false count anywhere. I, there were times when I, I wasn't just crawling back to the back as part of the show. I remember in Savannah, Georgia, crawling back to my hotel room because I had a Falls County where I match was staying and I thought we're gonna go comedy. And that when Stinger had me with the, with the plunger to the face in the middle of the ring and the crowd's not buying it, I realized, all right, they're not buying what we're selling. We have to sell a different you know, form of merchandise here. And then it became a really wild and brutal you know, backdrop on the floor type of thing. And those things really, really took their toll. Whereas you get almost the same pops with the salad tongs, the beal throw, and some good chemistry. Throw in uh, China, Mankind was becoming that character, you know, with the, the comeback. So I would say the great matches we had, which may not have been five-star or four-star matches on the, the, the Wrestling Observer scale, but they felt like four-star matches to me, were at the Tent Towns. 
the Cohasset, Massachusetts, and there was one in Rhode Island. Uh, uh, yeah, there was like three or four tent towns. They didn't, you know, 2,000, 2, 2,500 people, low roofs because it was a tent, uh, but great atmosphere. So talk to me about China. You're starting to have some more interaction with China here. How was she to work with? I loved working with China, and I loved Joni. She was great. Uh, we liked her from the moment we met her. Uh, Colette and I met her backstage in Chattanooga. And, uh, it was that four-way with Vader. Final uh, four. Final four. February 97. Yep, five, February 97. I remember her you know, coming out of the crowd to shake Terry Runnels like a rag doll. Yeah. And my wife and I talked to her afterwards, and you know, my wife said it was so impressive. And she said, "Really? Did you did you like it?" You know, she was uh, like a lot of us, a little bit insecure. And she found a home, you know, in this uh, outlandish cast of characters. Her, her and Triple H became a couple, um, a real great power couple, and that was part of the equation in making Triple H. You know. A big deal. Uh, a big deal. Really big deal. So the next night on Raw is where everything with Brett and Sean happens with the physical confrontation backstage that we talked about. But as a result, the show has to be rebooked uh, because clearly Sean was figured in in a big way and now he's off the show. So as a result, you're all over the doggone show. Uh, Hunter has his coronation and he starts, quote unquote, shooting on Vince about how politics blocked him from winning the year before. Pretty inside baseball. Really? Feels very yeah, Vince yeah. Russo yeah. talking about the curtain call, of course. But you interrupt him on screen asking for a rematch, and uh, China says for you to come down and kiss her ass. I said I'm a good kisser. That's your lucky That's day. Right. I'm a good kisser. Uh, of course, you go down and, and get your ass beat. And then JR finishes part four of his interview with you. This is a big show for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, the night after you lose in the finals, you have some fun interaction, hit that great kisser line, which normally maybe Mankind wouldn't have done. But now we've gotten to know you, part four <laughs> airs. And in hindsight, if you would have known that this interview was going to turn you babyface, do you think you still would have ended with the mandible claw? On JR? Yeah. <sighs> you know, that turned into something so unique anyway yeah because it was uh and this wasn't scripted this is me uh, you know jr started asking those questions and do you think that maybe this is your own fault and i said what i think is maybe you ought to start doing your damn job and i then i slowly lose it to the point where i hit his hat you know and you ran of integrity why i ought to i said the words why i ought to like it's out of a 50s western and uh, yeah and I, I, and boom i put it on and when Jim goes down, then I get up as if it wasn't me at all. I go, he's going to need some help out here. He's going to need some help out here. And so I was showing great deference for my fellow human being. And and then Jim sold it in a way where he was like, it's not your fault, you know, the next week on TV. Uh, and I gave him the, the Manable Claw glove on a hand, which is was still in his office last I knew. Uh, so even if... It wasn't, you know, maybe you could say, I, I, I'd say it ended well. I think that only added to the character and um, and added to the intrigue of the character. Did Jim get the uh, the real man of a car or the friendly man? He had to give him the real one, brother. Had to give him the real one. It's television. It. Got to lay that stuff in. Later that night, you're inserted into a match against Brian Pillman that was originally supposed to have Austin taking him on. Um, this is your first time being around Brian in the ring like this yeah. since the WCW days. But since then, we know he had shattered his ankle in a horrific Hummer crash, and he was probably not the same in-ring performer after. Yeah. Do you remember that match with Brian? Not too much of it. I remember the matches we had in WCW much better than that one. Uh, to close the episode here, it's reported in The Observer that you had agreed uh, verbally to a five-year renewal. Were you happy to sort of scratch that itch? Did this feel like, okay, we got exactly what we were looking for. We're headed in the right. Because you had talked before, man, I could get a handful of more years. A five-year deal with the number you wanted, you had to feel like a oh, sense of relief, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Especially, I think, the final two years were up in that you know where you wanted to be in that 400k range and then none of it mattered anyway because i went above the minimum every year of the contract so 
And that really, at the time, you probably felt like was going to be your last contract. Yeah, I mean, let's sure. again put this in context. We're talking the summer of 97. So five years later, I don't think you probably imagined you'd be wrestling in 02. And as it was, you know, I was done, you know, two and a half years later yeah. from full-time wrestling. Uh, from your book, my contract negotiation had also gone well. It didn't make me rich, but it certainly provided security for my family. And if I invested wisely, the money could make me wealthy over time. I was able to have several advantages, uh, advantageous conditions worked in, and my final deal was considerably more lucrative than the one offered a year earlier. So when you're saying advantageous conditions, you mean you're flying first class? No, I, I didn't even know what a first class ticket looked like until I became WWE champion. Really? Yeah. So I don't know what advantageous conditions I was talking about because the contract still didn't call for, you know, my travel to be paid. Uh, airplanes would be. Yeah. But hotels and uh, rental cars, I had tried to get that in my contract saying that uh, WWE could look at it as an investment because they knew I wasn't going to treat myself as well as I should. Jay argued, JR would counter by saying that's part of the process. You know, you've got to examine your priorities uh, and keep yourself, you know, keep that machine running. Uh, so I don't know what those, but it, was, it wasn't first class. I remember asking Sean Waltman specifically, like, uh, what's an F fare? I'd never seen an F fare. You know, you get a Y fare, a Q, a B, and all these. That's first. You're in first class. And I said, has there been some type of mistake? And he goes, no, you're the champion. Like, you, the champion always flies first class. And then even after I dropped the title of The Rock, those F fares kept coming. Uh, and I thought there'd been some type of mistake. And then it may have been Sean Waltman telling me, no, you're, you're, you're grandfathered in. Because at that time, title changes are still a pretty rare occurrence. It was a big deal to be champion. Yeah, you wouldn't have six or seven former WWE champions on the roster. You might have two or three, and it was a big deal. Um, and I've been really lucky that that's been part of my deal ever since. I'm curious from a, a travel standpoint, you know, I've often heard wrestlers, I think Lou Albano is the first one credited with saying it, all that matters, all that's real is the money and the miles. But I've also known in more recent years, guys started to travel by bus for maybe the last decade or yeah. so. In hindsight, do you think your career could have been extended? Maybe you could have had a longer run had you been afforded the whole bus treatment? I don't think so. I think my career could have been extended if... I had realized at a pivotal point that I didn't need to be 280 anymore. I didn't have to justify the weight by saying I'm working with The Undertaker, I've got to oppose a physical, physical threat to him. That's the point where I could have gone down. I was over enough where I could have gone down 30 pounds and the, and the audience would have accepted it, and instead I went up 30 pounds. So now instead of being 280 during the best part of my career, I was 300 plus. And that, I think, contributed to the problems I was having with my knees. And, the, uh, and then when my knees went, now it's an over-reliance on wild bumps. So uh, I think I, I did serve myself really poorly by not, but, you know, at that point, you just, I'm sore every day. I'm beaten up and, and I'm, not, I'm not a pill guy at all. Yeah. I'd maybe taken a, you know, a handful in my life. And what did comfort me was those late night stops. A little Whataburger here. A little there. Whataburger. And it didn't seem like too much to ask. Like, I'm a guy, I'm on the road 200 plus days a year. I'm hurting when I come home. I'm hurting pretty much all the time. What's wrong with it? Whether it be, uh, you know, stop at Perkins for a piece of pie. I, you know, that was didn't seem like it didn't seem like that much to ask in return for what I was doing, but it was, it showed itself. So in hindsight, so, the two things that maybe would have added more time to your career, knee pads yeah, and better diet. Yeah, knee pads, yeah, yeah. But I don't think the bus, because I, lo I love driving. I did, and uh, um, I don't think it was until I came back as a commissioner that I was pretty much on my own all the time because I was flying into a city that uh, the rest of the crew was already there they already had their rides and so i was renting a car i was getting a hotel I, at that point it may have been taken care of by the company um 
and uh, I, yeah, I really enjoyed, you know, I, I come out to do these shows, right? You know, like I, I, first of all, I think it's better for the show. Talking about our podcast, Foley's Pod, the uh, podcast that's sweeping the coast. Yep, uh, the, the nation from coast to coast. And you're the host with the most. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I look at those buses, and that just seems like uh, it just seems like an extravagance. Um, I, well, a lot of the guys use it not to keep from driving a rental car, but to not have to do air travel, right? So now instead of being crammed into a middle seat, you know, row 32 at 200. Well, anybody who's pounds. getting the bus isn't sitting in a middle seat. Well, in that's coach fair. Anyway, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, the airport, the everyday airport thing, even though it sucks, even when it's even if you go out there and you're driving most of that loop, there's still a handful of flights on every uh, on a 10 day loop. And they get delayed. They get canceled. Yeah. You know, you could miss a connection. I mean, it's it's a hassle. And I think a lot of the guys use it uh, as a way to maybe afford them themselves more time with the family. Uh, because on the bus, it's okay if your wife and kid are yeah, on you're bus right. and yeah. playing PlayStation or whatever. And that, to me, feels like, and again, I realize not a lot of guys who are doing that these days, but it's a tax deduction, and it makes life on the road a little easier physically, but also just mentally with your family. And me knowing you or getting to know you better, it feels like, man, if you could have had the Foley clan with you, I think a bus. They were with me quite a bit. Yeah. They were with me uh, whenever they weren't in school. I mean, I had them frequently. Um, and we were okay. In the, I mean, I'm a car guy, you know. A van guy. I'm a van guy. And a van guy. And it's like. Uh, it's not that different. It's that movie with John Travolta where he calls it the Cadillac and minivans, right? And it's, a, yeah, I still love a van. I love a good van. So I don't know. Uh, it seems like an unnecessary extravagance. But if you're telling me it's prolonging careers and making family lives better. I've just heard a lot of guys say that. Yeah. That it, the bus made a, a, a big difference. I've heard Big Show. And, and obviously, he. He's got a different different travel circumstance than a lot of folks. Yeah. Uh, so I could see how, hey, man, I don't want to cram into a, even a first-class seat. Probably isn't comfortable when you're seven foot something. No. But if you have a whole bed and you can just lounge and have your wife and kid around, okay, well, that's different. Yeah. You've heard Mick talk about it for years. AG1, Mick and I absolutely love AG1. We start each and every day with a simple scoop. That's it. That's all we need. One single scoop and a cup of water. And buddy, we're getting 75 different high quality ingredients. It's going to hook you up and give you all the key daily nutrients. And it's going to go ahead and support everything you need, your energy, your focus, your strength, your clarity. This is just a a no brainer to me. Think of it as like your foundational nutrition product. You know, listen, we all get busy and we wind up. Well, I didn't want to do this for lunch, but I don't feel like I have an option or, well, I know I need to Dude, this is easy. Just one scoop every single day. You're making sure you're taking care of your most valuable asset. You, you cover all your bases. You're looking for better gut health. You want to boost in energy. You want to support that immune system. Maybe you hate taking pills or vitamins. Maybe you just want a supplement that tastes good. I drink mine every single morning. My wife does hers before she even does her coffee. It makes her feel unstoppable on her way to the gym. And I think it gives me more focus at work. I feel like I'm more productive and I don't have that crash in the afternoon. I feel like I'm more productive all day long. We started this back even before the pandemic started. My wife did, but when the pandemic started, man, she had me start doing it. We've done it every day since we are huge fans. I think you will be too. Even our daughters are into it. Now Morgan's actually taking some down to Tuscaloosa with her. With every single serving, you're setting yourself up for success. I just can't recommend it enough. By the way, you don't have to take our word for this. Just go look up their reviews. These cats have thousands of five-star reviews. It's the real deal. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go right now to drinkag1.com slash Foley. That's drinkag1.com slash Foley. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. Um, Either way, though, this was fun today. I'm glad we got to talk about the interviews today, and I'm really glad that we've reached everyone's favorite part of the show. But is it hurt that we've already seen mankind? I don't think that's possible. All right, because this uh, young man who we do not deem to be... uh, 
WAP worthy. Yeah, WAP appropriate. Appropriate. I think everybody's WAP worthy. Uh, so we're going to well, see what we have he, here. If he's a real big fan of yours, he's going to eventually see the WAP song here on the show. <laughs> but I'd feel bad. It's his mom requesting the video. I just Highly think, inappropriate. Okay. So anyway, so Elijah. Okay. His favorite is Mankind. Uh, all right. So let me see. I, I like gotta, Elijah. He likes Mankind. We've seen a lot of dude love. I'm pumped for more Mankind. <laughs> My birthday is June 27th, if you're listening. It's uh, cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley. Even give you a special deal. Use the promo code FOLEY20, capital F, FOLEY20. Get you a special deal. Do it on the website, though. Don't do it on the app. All right. So we're going to start out in dude love mode today, here today. All right. And the hippest cat. The hippest the cat in all the land. And maybe segue into some... Uh, into some mankind here. So what? Whoa! Fresh making a comeback with the Whataburger as an assist. What we're gonna do is, um, dude, love. I spent all last night in addition to writing and rewriting the WAP song. Uh, I rewrote Dude Love's entrance song. Oh! I think you're really gonna appreciate it. Yeah, the original song had uh, three words in it: Dude, Love, and Baby. And this one's got just a few more. Ready? Okay. So here we go. Oh, Elijah, my man, my main man, your eyes are not deceiving you. This is exactly who I think you're thinking. I think you think, I think you think it is. The hip cat that I'm thinking, you think, I think, you think, I think you think it is, is none other than dude love. And I understand Amanda has given dude the word. They're celebrating a very special day. And we're not talking about Groundhog's Day, Daddy, or Take a Child to Work Day. You know what day I'm talking about, Elijah. I'm talking about... Birthday, talking about your birthday, birthday, yeah, 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 happy birthday from your favorite face of Foley, birthday, ow, yes, Elijah, I believe the exact quote Amanda gave to me is you thought that Cactus Jack was highly overrated and mankind not a big deal to begin with because you know that it was the dude who knew how to get down and do that, wait, wait, Hey, please, please, I was just, I was just joking. Oh, man, that really burns my butt. I can't believe it. Clearly, Elijah, you are a Mankind fan. You did not ask for Dude Love. He is not your favorite face of Foley. So let's see if I can rectify that situation, because I know you eat sleep wrestling, and you want to be a wrestler when you grow up. You're a great kid with a good heart. You would love to meet me in person one day. That can happen, but not before you meet mankind through the miracle of a video. So hold on a second. Let me see if I can find the three-time WWE champion. Yeah, I'm right here, Elijah. This is me, mankind. I don't have a song to sing except maybe... Ha, ha, ha. Uh, yeah. Come on, everybody. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. One more time. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, this is mankind. Thank you for thinking of me to make this day nice. Oh, wow. What a virtuoso. I can't say it's a virtuoso performance, but I also had uh, Conrad Thompson and the great Dave Grillo there. And uh, this has been your cameo video. And Elijah, I'll open up the DMs so we can figure out a time and a place to make that meeting happen. In the meantime, may all your days be nice. Oh, that was a hit, right? Come on now. Uh, that might be the best one yet. You were like my Jordan Ayers on that one. Dude, right? ha, 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 ha. didn't see it coming. <laughs> I didn't either. It's tremendous. It just made magic. Now, if we'd scripted that thing. It wouldn't have been as good. Of, we may have doubled off the wall, but that, my friends, was a home run. That right? was a home yeah. run, and you can get a home run right now at cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley and use that special promo code Foley20, capital F, get a special deal there. It's good for everything, Mick, not just birthdays, but anniversaries, graduations, just a little pick-me-up. Got somebody's going through something. Maybe they kicked out of a surgery. Got a little pick-me-up. Yeah. Uh, I got my kids a Nick Gage uh, video for Christmas. I got one, too. I, 
<laughs> Did you really? Someone sent me a Nick Gage one, and it was one of the coolest. I'm, I'm a member. I have it in my wallet. I'm a card-carrying member of MDK. Now. Are you really? Yeah, MDK all freaking day. So I wanted Nick to know that although I'm not a cursor by nature, that uh, it's not a Nick Gage interview, not a Nick Gage camera without that. So, uh, yeah, so the kids really enjoyed that. And um, and I have, like I said, I've gotten myself a, a handful of them just to lift my days, and it's really been effective. So if you're out there for any reason or no reason at all, cameo.com slash Mick Foley. Enter the code Foley with a capital F, 20 at checkout. You get 20% off. How about that? And by the way, this was not a plug. This is more of a public service. Yeah, I think so. Because yeah. you're putting smiles on people's faces. That's what it's all about. How could you see what we just saw and not be happy? <laughs> so spread that love and cheer and uh and help right support here. the bread heart of cameo the best, the best there, there is, is the best there was the best there ever will be mr in your house himself the hardcore legend mick foley we'll be back next week and mick i'm pumped next week we're talking about dude love oh Finally. i thought you were, we were talking about the my wap uh you want to do wap next week next week yeah we'll do that next week a little wap action coming <laughs> your way right here no we're going to turn it into hab happy ass birthday yeah, so we're not going, you know, yeah, come on, come on. This. What, what would yours even be? Like, if you had to, weak-ass punches? I don't know. We'll come up with something next week right here. On <laughs> 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 Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple Podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad-Free Shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like Title Chase, Eric Fires Back, Conversations with Conrad, and The Insiders, plus new series like The Book with David Crockett, Monday Mailbags with Mike Chioda and Nick Patrick, and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early, you can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus, ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch-alongs, Q&As, and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today, and hey, when you do, the first week is completely free, adfreeshows.com.